We've seen changes in the world around us, large parts of the world. Developing economies, low-income economies, developed economies are facing uh, the crisis of uh, the changes that we are seeing, whether it's floods, wildfire, the impact on agriculture, the impact on food, energy. All of that is front and center for us to take cognizance of and take cognizance of today. The question, though, is, is there enough will at this point in time, political, business will? Is there enough financing? Is there access to technology? Uh, can we ensure that access to technology is going to be equitable? Who is going to fund all of this? Those are some of the questions that we are going to be addressing here. Faike, let me get started with you. We're very clear that we need to move in parallel as far as adaptation and mitigation is concerned, and that has to be the way forward. How far have we moved on that front? How far have we moved on realizing that adaptation requires intervention? It requires urgent intervention. Yes, thank you, and, and thanks for organizing this, this panel. Uh, I'm glad that adaptation gets more and more attention, but we are not yet there at all. Uh, people found it difficult to understand what is now all this climate actions, climate mitigation, adaptation, what is all, loss and damage, etc. Break mitigation, it down. Break it down for everybody who's watching. Mitigation is trying to prevent that we come above one and a half degrees. So decreasing emissions. Although we know we will not manage that. We need to continue with mitigation, but we will not manage it. Already today, for Africa, for Indonesia, for India, Climate change is a reality, not to grow enough food to eat. So it's nothing for the future, something today. So therefore, next to mitigation, we need to work on adaptation, making our food systems more resilient, that we can grow food. Also, when it is flooding or droughts, that we have different water systems, infrastructure cities. That is adaptation. Then we have a third one added to that recently in Egypt. That's loss and damage, where we admit it that there is a root cause by some and there is some suffering. So that's more a financing thing. Still need to be filled in. On the adaptation, it is not enough money which is allocated now. Only 20% of what is needed is now being available. And that 20% does not find its way with business. Only 1% of the global adaptation budget is spent by business. Business is almost absent in the total adaptation thing. So adaptation needs to be much higher on the agenda, and we need to be able to involve the private sector also to come with new seeds that can grow when there is not enough water, with new water systems, with new way to protect cities for floodings, with new way to protect infrastructure, etc. And the technologies are there, but we have still to orchestrate it. And we need to make clear what it is. And one last thing, uh, sorry. On mitigation, we have a clear goal. We need to keep the world below one and a half degree. Okay. On adaptation, we need to become more resilient. Whatever that is, we don't have a clear common, well-defined, single goal, and that makes it more complicated. Bob Moritz, let me address this issue with you. As Faike pointed out, and you were talking to me about this as well just before we started, that if there were 80 CEOs in Davos who were talking about climate change and the need for intervention, the need for collaboration, why is Faike saying that there is no will at this point in time? There is no access to finance. We don't know who to go to, where to go to, and how to put those two together. Why this deficit? So as Feike described, we have a great conversation, and I want to be clear, the CEOs have been having conversations on the topic of mitigation, and they have been taking action on that. I want to be super clear. What we have done is done it in lieu of, and unfortunately at the expense of, adaptation. So the WEF, and appropriately so, commissioned a report that actually would do the course correction to bring the business community, to bring equal prominence to the business narrative, the government nar narrative, and the societal narrative of why this is important. And in order to do that, what's it going to take to get the business community to step up to the challenge, not to at the expense of mitigation, but rather get equal amount of time, attention, capital, and action on the issue of adaptation. The report specifically talks about how do we enhance this in terms of the business resiliency that businesses have to deal with? How do we actually turn a negative into a positive in terms of the upside potential? I'll come back to that point in a second. And third, how do we bring together collaborative examples 
where it has helped business, but also society, local communities. And that's usually important. I want to come back to that point. So the report itself did a study of 100 companies. And to Feike's point, this issue is here now. Of the 100 companies, 70 of them already have gone through catalytic issues that have actually impacted, because of the physical issues, the physical risk issues, an event happened that has never happened before, and it is happening more and more times. And the reality is, in one given year, it's 10% of the revenue. Go to the other side of the equation. If, in fact, these organizations did the things we're asking them to do in terms of the innovative techniques, leveraging technologies, which we'll talk about in a second, there is upside potential. That upside potential comes in the form of revenue, brand, stakeholder capitalism coming through, and the avoidance of cost, therefore the avoidance of investment, that investment can go to other places to actually achieve the SDGs. Whatever we do on adaptation, we cannot reduce the mitigation efforts sure. that Feike talked about, point number one. Point number two, adaptation does not mean walking away from a city that may have potential flooding or drought risk. It means working with the city, working with the government sure. to make sure that we stay for societal benefits, for societal reasons, and we have the economic development happening. And that's where capital has to come in in the big time way. So the CEOs in that deficit, this is now the pivot. The report was helping accelerate that pivot. And that's what we're looking to see over the next year or two. Excellent. I'll get to the issue of financing and capital in just a second. But let me get Ms. Kamdani into the conversation as well. You've heard what Faike as well as Bob Moritz have had to say. You know, you come from Indonesia. Uh, as we've been pointing out, it is countries like India, Indonesia, Africa that are facing the vulnerabilities, the challenges of what is happening to climate change at this point in time. Is this a matter that has political buy-in? Uh, is there political will to try and see where you can access technology, where you can access capital, to try and move down this road? What is the experience at this point in time? Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, join this panel. Um, I was excited yesterday hearing, you know, the leaders was talking about climate change. And um, I think uh, Vice President Al Gore was saying, you know, political will is renewable resource, right? So. Um, the feeling that I get right now is when we talk about, I mean, we don't even have to talk about adaptation yet, talk about climate change in general. There's still a big gap between the developed countries and developing countries. And we have to address that gap because when businesses come to picture, we cannot just look at the <coughs> global uh, businesses. We have to also talk about the local businesses. So first of all, I think, uh, the what, the what is adaptation? Mm -hmm. I mean, you were mentioning even even you know the the, the most advanced uh, companies are still not clear. Yep. You know, how about us? You know, where we're coming from? You know, we're between. I mean, mitigation is we're starting, but adaptation is still very far off, right? So so what it is actually needs to be social. I mean, we need to educate. Mm -hmm. and what what kind of program can we actually do? And when we talk about the who, right, it's government, yes, but where does each government stand also differ in their point, right? There are so many priorities of government. When we talk even about achieving net zero, of course they will commit themselves. Indonesia had committed uh, to 2016 uh, achieving net zero, but it's just a commitment, right? We know that that has to be translated to companies on how they're going to each mm -hmm. um, achieve the net zero. So the work needs time. It, it is a process. And I just feel like we're running behind this, this time, right? And, and so, so that's, I think, bringing the actors. This is definitely a stakeholder engagement. We need to bring all actors in place. And this cannot be just government, business. It has to be all, the mm -hmm. civil society. And um, lastly, also, when we talk about um, uh, the how, yes, I agree, technology is important. Yes, I agree, finance is very, very important. But we have, in our part of the world, have to look at the social components. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many of the effort that we're doing are hindered by the social aspect. So the intergenerational social aspect is very, very important, and we have to prioritize and put through this as well. In the context of India, uh, you know, the how, have we been able to address that? In terms of being able to measure what needs to be done, how is the government looking at this issue at this point in time in terms of identifying outcomes 
impact? And more importantly, what is the biggest challenge that you face when we talk about adaptation and the need for adaptation? Is financing the issue? Is technology the issue? Is will the issue? What are the deterrents? Sure. You know, as we, uh, the G20 presidency is currently with India, you know, just to remind ourselves that the overall theme is one earth, one family, one future. And I think uh, in an interconnected world, you know, mitigation or adaptation, both are equally important. But we are coming out of COP27 and the sort of rebalancing of bringing adaptation back to the table, as was discussed, is very relevant for India. If you look at our NDCs, both mitigation and adaptation are equally balanced. What we are trying to do is we are trying to identify the most vulnerable mm. areas. So whether cities, you know, uh, coastal areas, food and agriculture, yeah. infrastructure. So uh, it's important to have a vulnerability index, which is something which we have started doing, so we can prioritize areas for adaptation. We are now considering embarking on a major program of mangrove plantations along our 7,000 uh, kilometers of coastline. Mm. So this one, it's going to be, you know, so if we can get that right, obviously it's going to be very challenging. It's going to take a lot of financing. Yep. But it will also include uh, livelihoods, particularly through Manrega, a rural employment guarantee program. And women will be major beneficiaries. So, you know, that's a program adaptation which will benefit women in particular. The third aspect I wanted to mention is something which the Prime Minister uh, announced at Glasgow, life, lifestyle for the environment. How can individuals and communities adapt to climate change, which is very, very real in India. You know, whether you're using less water or whether, you know, you are using less electricity yeah. in an era of, of climate change. So that's a major program <coughs> which will also feature in the G20. And of course, climate, environment, life, the energy transition are all major themes in the G20. But one point which we've always been emphasizing again, and you know, so, you know, where's the money? Yeah. And so uh, climate financing, uh, the technology transfer will yep. be important, but capacity building as well. So there are major challenges in India. Jacqueline, let me come to you. Uh, you know, Jacqueline is the food person on this panel, as she <laughs> called herself. So in light of what you've heard today, the answer also lies in being able to provide equitable innovation, frugal innovation at scale to be able to achieve some of these uh, immediate challenges that we need to address. How confident, hopeful do you feel in your own experience with what you are doing that we will be able to get to that? Thank you. It's great to be here. Be great to be part of this conversation as a mission-driven innovator. But I, so I'm very optimistic uh, when it comes to technology, and uh, I think there's amazing technology that's already out there. I think you know we can talk about climate-smart technologies, whether it's it's climate-adapted animals, it's crops that are drought tolerant, heat tolerant, um, and um, you know, even, even early warning systems with the, the potential for AI to predict disease outbreaks or you know, um, uh, weather events. I think, so I'm very confident that the technologies that are out there exist. You know, what I am most concerned about is actually access to those technologies. Historically, it's been the biggest issue yep. is access. But then there's the uh, the adoption. So we can so assume we can get technology, technology to the places that it's needed. How do we get farmers who are very traditional? It's a livelihood. It's not necessarily a business. How do we get them to be a part of the solution as well as a rapid adopter of new technologies um, uh, to make this impact? And so, um, you know, this is this is an area where I think you know the importance. If you talk about infrastructure and the needs of infrastructure, that will facilitate digital. Yep. Digital infrastructure will facilitate access. It will facilitate adaptation, I mean, adoption of technologies. And I think mostly because it will facilitate this, the education. I mean, this is the human component. This is the community component of it. And the education, you have to educate the youth, the, the, the young farmers, the people who are going to be the next generation farmers on what's coming. Where is the money going to come from? How much money do we need? Well, <clears throat> maybe let's start with some money we are destroying uh, and making clear that uh, climate change is not something for the future we need to be afraid of, but it's something today. Last year, only of physical infrastructure, we had over 100 billion money uh, damage and money lost of physical harm of infrastructure, houses, farms, whatever. 
over 100 billion. Insurance companies increasingly say in certain areas, certain risks are not theoretical risk, which we statistically can calculate once in 100 years, once in 50 years, but will happen every single year. If it happens every single year, we are not going to insure that anymore because that's our, our model. And people expect that that 100 billion will increase every single year. Next to that, millions of people last year, millions of people lost their life due to climate change. So we need to continue with the mitigation, like Bob was saying, and the CEOs and business and everybody want to prevent it more and more. But in parallel, once again, we need to work on adaptation. Two things on that one, on the money. The business sector needs to step up. And one thing which I'm a little bit puzzled about is that the business sector has two reasons to join the adaptation. One is purely out of self-interest, because business has a vulnerable supply chain in agricultural streams, in flooding of sites, in droughts, or if you are in South Africa, there's no drinking water, don't expect your people to uh, appear on work, etc. So why not adapt uh, your own supply chain and your own operations and spend money there. That's purely self-interest. 99% of the adaptation money is coming from the public sector now. That cannot be. We expect even at the end of the day that 80%, now it's 1%, that 80% will come from the private sector. The private sector needs to invest much more in adaptation. There's three sub-components to it which are really important. First. You've got to get the business narrative so the private sector wants to invest and you want to make sure that the ROI is super clear, either from a self-interest perspective to what they do or, for that matter, the ROI they're going to get. And if you actually look at the ROIs embedded in either mitigation or adaptation, you're probably more likely to get a higher ROI from the avoidance of the cost and all the liabilities right. associated with it if you actually focus on adaptation. So, so we've got to just make that business case perfectly clear to the financing organizations that are out there and get the business community to be more vocal on that particular point in terms of what they need to do. Second, you've got to bring the public-private partnership together and where the business community can help more so, where those evangelists can help more so, is how can we make it easier for politicians to say yes? Because this is usually now political at the local level. It is a crowded agenda in terms of what they are focused on, spending money on, and especially as you go into an environment where there's going to be less revenues and therefore less ability to invest, how do you make it higher priority? So we've got to help the politicians in terms of why this is so important. But Jacqueline, let me address this issue with you. Since we're talking about solutions, we're talking about the next steps now. In your experience, in the context of the conversation that we're having, what would you like the private sector and governments to prioritize at this point in time to make any headway? I think the biggest priority is digital infrastructure. I'm heartened to hear about the broadband across all of India because I think I think there are things that you can do with communication and education today that don't require movement of a lot of technology, like adoption of regenerative agriculture, could have a huge impact. Um, and so, you know, I think that those are things where it's it's about education and getting and communicating with with um, farmers in rural areas to make a big impact. I, I want to make sure that when we finish this session something come out out of yes, it, right? Yes, so, so. absolutely. So tell, tell, absolutely. Us, tell us what exactly we should do, right? Because we can't say we just do on our own, like you yeah. said. You can't rely on it. We can't, right? We have... Please tell us, how are we... What, what is the... Is there a specific model? I mean, should we come up with specific project program, whatever? I mean, should we do it bilaterally? I mean... Should be not relying on this big money there, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that you that is the that is the perfect conclusion that we're <laughs> looking for. Yes, Paramayer. No, I'm just saying. You know, I don't know if any white smoke is coming out of this session. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, certainly I'm not holding my breath. As you said, you know, it, it it it'll happen when it happens. If it happens, it's good to know that loss and damage is on the agenda. But clearly, we've got to act now. And. I think one important point I wanted to mention, in the G20, as part of our finance track, the, you know, the reform of the multilateral institutions is key. So we're talking of uh, multilateral institutions for the 21st century, and I've worked in the World Bank for many years. I think it's a, they play a critical role now. Let, you know, let's, let's see uh, if they're going to step up to the plate in terms of at least de-risking private investment. And if we can do that and bring that towards adaptation, 
I think that could make a difference, but you know, there's a discussion going on and we will be pushing for that as part of the finance group discussion in India. Okay. Let me give one practical example because I agree with you. A project which we started up is private public in Africa. We started in Rwanda and want to spread it across the continent. We started with 10,000 farmers, now we have 150,000 farmers in Rwanda. We tell to the farmers, we buy for the next three years everything you can grow. The farmer says, hey, we never had three days uh, commitment, now we have three years commitment. If you really stick to that, I start investing in agriculture techniques, in new seeds, which can uh, I grow even when there's drought or when there's flooding, etc. We give technology to the farmers to do that. Then we bring all the stuff to a big, huge factory we built, a few in Kigali. We process it locally for the locally sourced products, locally to healthy products. And now one and a half million people in Rwanda eat out of that factory, are not stunted anymore, into healthy products. Locally sourced with local farmers doing much better than before. We need to take care that Africa, Indonesia, India can be self-supporting yep. at the end of the day. These kind of scalable mm -hmm. initiatives, not local hobbyism, which is <laughs> nice, but no, you need to have scalable initiatives, otherwise it doesn't work. No, absolutely. Yeah, so, so let's, let's do Rwanda in Indonesia, right? <laughs> that is that model. Okay? There, there you go. There you go. Something concrete has come, come out of this panel. Bob Moritz, we've got exactly a minute, and I'm going to close with you. Uh, you talked about how the report points towards a, uh, a course correction. And that's what I want you to leave the audience with. What are the priorities? What are the imperatives? Where do we need to make the most course correction today? The, the three things I would go to is to make sure the narrative is actually on everybody's agenda going forward and equally as important in the emerging markets that need it most, that have suffered the most and potentially going to suffer the most. Number two, actually get the bankers to help with the capital and the financing associated with this. And third, there are examples like Fikey has talked about in lots of parts of the world, including the technology and the education relevant to the labor force. I would just say, as we use you as an example, pick five or six examples from the rest of the world. Let's bring them in, get them implemented and scaled up as quickly as we possibly can. There's lots of fantastic ideas that are no longer ideas, but rather actionable and having impact. Our challenge is how do we leverage them, scale them, and not waste time in doing so. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us here.